Hello everyone and welcome to our next encounter study. We are looking at December 18th. This is the fourth Sunday. Fourth Sunday of Lent or Advent. Advent. Which, wait, what season Advent. were you in? Okay, Advent. Advent. We're in Advent. I don't know where Chris just went with that. Um, today our scripture selection comes from Matthew chapter 1 verses 18 through 25. God is with us. Yeah. I am the right reverend no that's the not right it. reverend the right reverend no i am <laughs> reverend becky Zardi. i'm the director of ministry with women for the ministry council for the cumberland presbyterian church thank you for joining us today and i am joined by my co-host in crime the right reverend <laughs> doctor <laughs> <Yes>. most holy <laughs> chris fleming i'm the adult ministry coordinator for the ministry council of the cumberland presbyterian church thank you very much for your support and using the encounter um Hoping these have been beneficial for your spiritual life. I hope it's been able to help your church. Um, so thanks for joining us. Amen. Our memory verse today, well, we're actually, we're going to start with our prayer for illumination. We Sorry. can do that. Let's start with our prayer. Holy God, as we study about your son's birth, may we be reminded that he and his family were extremely faithful, and we are called to be too. Amen. Amen. Oh, that's a really good one. Our memory verse today comes from Matthew 1, 23. It says, look, the virgin shall become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. God is with us. Yes. So our introduction, Chris, you're the author for Who's this author? lesson. So our, our introduction, you start us off with this discussion question saying, can you recall a particularly impacting occasion when you received some startling news? Did it change the way you thought or lived? Yes. Okay. Um, I've said this here before, but um, my brother yes. passed away. That was the start of me changing my theology a lot. I wouldn't say changing my theology, but digging a little deeper um, into the um, into the I don't know the the meaning and the message of the gospel. Sure. I would say that's short order, but. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, but it did. It, it fundamentally changed my, started me on a path of, of a different way of thinking about it. Sure. So how about you? Having children. Yeah. Well, addendum. That is me that too. Is, <laughs> that is some startling news. It makes you uh, rethink your example and how you live your life and what kind of things are you bringing into your home and what are you exposing your children to. Yeah. You know. Yeah, so there's these things that make you think different. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially what's happened here in our story. Mm -hmm. Because Joseph his wife's pregnant and he has no other way of thinking about that other than something fishy <laughs> <laughs> happening something here. Something is not adding up. <laughs> and so he plan to divorce her quietly sure. but we find out that God often works in these unexpected ways that mm -hmm. force us to rethink what's going on mm -hmm. right miraculous ways um, and I would like to point out here before we get for the rest of this week of December 18th when everyone's gonna sing about how great Mary was and Oh, little did you know. What's the name of that yeah, song? Mary, did you know? Yeah, like Joseph was pretty amazing here. Absolutely. This was a, and we'll talk about it through the section, but this was an act of faith, him saying, sure, I'll go along for this ride. Sure. Right? Because this yeah. wasn't easy at all. No, absolutely not. There's there's some sort of short video out there about Mary and Joseph, and Joseph made a cake, and Mary came home and said, but we don't have an oven. And he said, how does that sound, Mary? Huh? How does that sound? Yeah. yeah, make a lot of sense to you. So, yes, Joseph was, was quite amazing in his in his faith yeah. himself, yeah. So I would just like to say, take, take a moment to really think about what this meant for Joseph. Because, like, sometimes we have this misconception that, like, people who lived 2,000 years ago just didn't understand science. They knew exactly oh, how, this, know how worked. this worked. Yeah. So this was something. Absolutely. Um, let's see. What anything? What? Yeah. So we have. So this is the story of the of the birth of Christ, and we have Mary and Joseph, mm -hmm. who have gone on to Bethlehem, and they're just trying to pay their taxes to the Roman Empire, and they end up staying in Bethlehem because 
Jesus arrived. Yeah. Which is an amazing. Thing. Jumped on the scene. Always yeah. unexpected. Yeah. So let's do some exploring the scripture here. Surely. We have Joseph. We, we talked about this just briefly a second ago, but Joseph was really trying to do the right thing. Yes. He was trying to be a, a good Jewish man. His wife, they weren't officially married. Again, we have to understand the cultural context. Yeah, I still don't really understand it. Though. So betrothal is, is an engagement in Jewish culture was just as serious as marriage. If you broke off the betrothal, you had to get a divorce, basically. Okay. okay. So... Here we have these two that are betrothed. They have not known each other biblically. They have <laughs> not known each other. Um, and yet Mary winds up pregnant. Right. So Joseph is trying to be the righteous person here and not wanting any harm to come to Mary and not want anything bad to happen to her or her family. Or his reputation. Or his reputation. That's true. He was just going to divorce her quietly and, and let it go. But we know that the angel showed up and said, hang on, go ahead. Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because she's conceived by the Holy Spirit. Right. Now this, I mean, let's be honest, that had to be a hard pill to swallow. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. He deserves a little, he deserves a little attaboy. Absolutely. Right. I mean, that had to be just like the craziest thing to, to really understand. But again, he just had an angel appear to him too, so... You know, also. the also kind of a crazy thing. But here we have Joseph trying to be the righteous person. And you write in here that trying to be a righteous, a person of righteousness and grace complicates life sometimes. Tremendously. Okay. Trying to do the right things will lead you down usually a harder path in the beginning. Sure. Probably better later. But sometimes skirting responsibility is easier when the situation first arises. Sure. What you've got something written down here. Uh-oh. I do. I said sometimes uh, doing the right thing goes against all logic. Yeah. You can't see how it works out no. well for you. No. I mean, how many times has God called you to do something and you knew it was the right thing to do, but you're trying to, like, look at this from all angles and you're going, this is not adding up. This is not working out well for me. And I don't understand why doing this or giving up all of this or whatever it is that God's called you to do can be the right thing to do. But yet if you follow through, it's to me, it's always amazing what grace God gives us through right. those moments in time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I brought up like, of course, when I was growing up, I've said before, I've, before I became a Christian, I was really big into the, you know, atheist stuff and, you know, apologetics against Christianity or whatnot. And so I had always heard, you know, these stories were just a mimic of other stories you could find and and, kind of true, but kind of not. I mean, there are a couple stories, but what I've got in here, I think is important. What sets this apart is this was foretold. Sure. So as much as we say that Joseph was shocked and awed, maybe one of the reasons as to why he could accept it was because he knew in the back of his head, behold, the virgin will be with child, and that the sure. baby would be born of the line of David, right? Yes, so, so he understood the scripture so that when he was confronted by the angel, it all started making sense. A little bit of sense, still kind of crazy. Sure. Um, and then the last thing I would say, I just, I love this um, illustration about the miraculous things that happen. Uh, and some people can't accept miracles. Mm. And there's a, a story that uh, C.S. Lewis uh, wrote, and I just want to read it. Lewis writes, if I'm in a hotel and I put a hundred dollars, pounds is what it is, a hundred pounds in the drawer on the first night and a hundred pounds on the second night, 100 plus 100 is 200. But on the third morning I wake up and there's only 50 pounds in the drawer, what do I conclude? The laws of, do I conclude that the laws of arithmetic have been broken, or rather the laws of England? Of course I conclude the laws of England have been broken and I've been robbed. But why do I conclude that? Because the law of mathematics have not been broken. And so what Lewis was trying to say when it comes to like a virgin birth, if you think this world is a closed system, there's only one way a baby's born. Sure. And it would be a violation of that law of, Mm -hmm. you know, reproduction but if god is god of creation he's imminent and transcendent Mm. 
then God can do what he wants. Yeah. And he it's not a break. It's still a baby is born in a womb, whatever. Right. It's just that there's something else. And so I, I like thinking about it like that. It's not as though any miracle in the Bible, if if the world is a closed system, then fine. Then it couldn't happen. But the world is not a closed system. The world is always open up to God's yeah. creative providence. Uh, and 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 God is in control of things. And so that's one way to think about that. I Absolutely. mean, if by faith you can accept that Christ can come back from the grave, then this probably isn't as far of a stretch uh, either. Sure. Which so. leads us over into our discussion question where you ask, many churches use the Apostles' Creed as their bedrock document of faith. In the Creed, there's a line, born of the Virgin Mary. Why have Christians throughout the centuries cared about the virgin birth? And do you believe the virgin birth is an essential doctrine of the faith? Why or why not? Well, I wrote it, so I'm going to let you do it. I think, uh, you know, it was foretold that the virgin would Would conceive. So I think it is an essential doctrine because I I think we do have to believe that that she was the virgin. Yeah, it depends on your theology. So within Protestantism, you have people that have um, said, you know, we don't need to worry about the virgin birth. But if your theology of the atonement is that Christ is a lamb mm. that has to be, you know, unblemished, mm-hmm. perfect. And if your theology is one that accepts um, original sin, mm-hmm. uh, then you have to kind of believe in the virgin birth. Because if not, then this Jesus person is truly just a human being. Just a human being, yeah. No matter how enlightened Jesus might be, he was not still born just a of human. God. Right. Absolutely. And not God in the flesh, if you will. Right. So um, I think, me personally, I will go on the side of this is a, an absolute doctrine um, that should be adhered to. Amen. Now, if someone else has a different uh, thought on that, it's not going to hurt my heart, except to say that I think um, the Kremlin Presbyterian Church, obviously, and, the, and most churches, the vast majority, I know uh, Church of Christ don't do creeds, but if they did, right. my friends, they would subscribe to the... Uh, to the Apostles' Creed, yes. and we would all say, born of the Virgin Mary. Yes, totally agree. So, so that's where we are in that. That's so where let's, we are. let's dig deeper into this section. All right. So we have the, the writings here in the, the Old Testament, you point out, bring us up to this point, that they're very rich, that there's a lot of well-known passages. Isaiah 7 is one of those um, about the foretelling of the birth of Christ. Yeah, so Isaiah 7 is the one that's um, really, Isaiah 7, 9, I think is what it is. Uh, yes, it's Isaiah 7, 9. So, and, and I won't regurgitate the story. You can read that in there. Uh, excuse me, it's Isaiah 7, 14 through 17. But essentially what's happened is, is that the Israelites are under siege. Mm-hmm. And the choice is Ahaz could believe God. Mm-hmm. And God would take care of situation, or mm, there's an or he could reach out. Uh, I think it was to the Egyptians. Reach out for help from the Egyptians. I believe mm. is who it was. And Assyrians. Assyrians. Yep. Okay, yeah, the Assyrians. So God sends Isaiah to the king Ahaz and says, "Hey, look, don't worry about this. This this is nothing. Just believe me. Believe me." You don't want to partner right. with these Assyrians because if you do, it's going to get bad on yeah. you. And so um, Az- or Ahaz asked for a sign, right? Uh, yeah, I don't know if he asked for a sign or if he said, I'll... anyway, Isaiah says, just to help you with your faith, behold, and you can imagine it in your mind, he points to some young maiden and says, behold, this young maiden or virgin, depends on how you want to translate it, will be with child. And by the time that child is born, uh, everything will be taken care of. Ahaz decides not to do that. Uh, and he does partner with the Assyrians. Assyrians yeah. So so that's the original context for that passage. Sure. And oftentimes in, in biblical prophecy, you'll have a an immediate fulfillment or an right. immediate prophecy which speaks to the time and place that um, that is happening, but more often than not, there's a, future. there's a future, and then a lot of times even a future future. But nonetheless, this is one of those times where, behold, the virgin shall be with child was applicable back then, but then it finds ultimate fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Uh-huh. 
So there's that part. Uh -huh. um, and the unfortunate part was because Ahaz didn't trust in God and trusted in what he could see, which was the Assyrians, they ended up becoming a vassal state. Yes, and that's and, where things get. And got terribly, they were plundered and just, and then eventually captured by the Babylonians. And, and yes. we know how that went. Didn't go as well. With the Babylonians. That was not, that was not awesome. Not at all. Let's see what I've got on there. Um, I have got... Uh, one of the things that we, we get from this then is that the Old and the New Testament, they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. They're not supposed to be like, oh, this was the holy book for the Jews, and then and then it no. becomes like important for A us Christians. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, no. it's, it's one big story. Yeah. Like, God has been working since the beginning of Genesis to recreate the Garden of Eden that was lost. So that's... That's important. That's how the New Testament thinks of itself. It thinks of itself as the revealing or the fulfillment of all that went before it. Yes. Um, and then ultimately, I think in this scripture, we can put ourselves in, um, we can put ourselves in Ahaz's place, in the sure. sense of God is promising that God is with us. Yeah. Now, whether we have eyes of faith to believe that and then act accordingly. Yeah. Um, what do we do? Right. right. Like, and especially during this season of Advent, when we're talking about the coming again of right. Christ, you know, do we have eyes to believe that? Do we have ears to hear? And, and do we trust that this is actually going to, to occur? Or are we putting things, our trust and faith in the things that we can talk, see, taste, touch, yeah. and feel? Yeah. Yeah. These are great questions. So the discussion question you talk about why is it important for Matthew to connect the birth of Jesus with the prophecies of Isaiah and what are some of your favorite passages to read during Advent and Christmas? So it's important. I think it's important for us to understand because it is one story. Right. It is not a, as you said, it's not just this was the Hebrew Bible and this was applicable to only the Jews and now all of a sudden we have something new and it, it is one long continued story of how God has interacted with his people all throughout history and how he's trying to bring us back to that garden, to that beautiful creation and bring back that right relationship that we had in the beginning that was broken. I think another thing is that you know who Jesus is. Sure. So like throughout, you know, ever since Micah was done writing, in the Old Testament, you'd have uh, people pop up and claim to be the Messiah that was promised. Uh -huh. And so, you know, that happened over and over and over and over yeah. again. And so, like, one part of, of me is always a little bit gentle with the Pharisees because, like, oh, look, there's another one. And it didn't always work well because, you know, if a Messiah rose up, a quote-unquote Messiah rose up and uh, got the people all rowdy, then, you know, the outside emperor empire or emperor would come in and crush and so sure. how many times can that happen before you're like i wish y'all would just stop <laughs> sure uh and so but because of these prophecies um you get to know that this is the one mm -hmm. you can put your hope in this yes. person and and that, i think that is important and yeah. and sometimes christians are accused of reading back into the old testament these things but the new testament authors like matthew will see as we continue on in Matthew, Matthew's purposeful about, and John was purposeful, and they're always purposeful about saying, I'm not reading back into this. This is what it said. This is what happened, right? Yes. So that's it's an It's important. just another way of proving that Jesus was the true Messiah because he fulfilled everything that was written in the Old Testament. Right. That's how we how we get that. So what, what are your, some of your favorite passages? Sorry. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Love Isaiah 53. I think that's a great one. I know it's, it's kind of like kind of a Easter thing, but I, I had to memorize it for a Christmas thing. And, uh, and well, so that's the thing about the birth of Christ. It's hard to separate it from the death of Christ in a sense. Mm -hmm. Like every all the prophecies are the Messiah is coming and he's going to be killed mm -hmm. but risen again. So anyway, what about you? I, I think this Isaiah one that you listed no. was 7, 14 through 17. I really, I really enjoy that one. It's because it's so, I think the, the miraculous part of it, the virgin conceiving is, is to me just a, a beautiful, yeah. a beautiful thing. Yeah. And then I guess I like any, anything. I will say this. So you could also, if you're teaching this, you could also ask about hymns. A lot of the really oh, good yeah. hymns are based on, um, 
you know, the biblical passages. Uh-huh. Um, I'm a huge big fan of Handel's Messiah, which Ooh. we do at Christmas originally. Nice. Was an Easter piece of Easter. Sure, movie. sure. But we've, for whatever reason, our culture have assigned that to Christmas, and so. But That's I like that. And that, if you haven't ever actually heard anything but uh, the Messiah part, it's basically it's just the scripture collection of the birth of Christ and and how Christ fulfills being the Messiah. So it's worth listening to. Anything else on that one? I also like Silent Night. Holy Night? Yeah, that one. That one always gets me. There's something about the shepherds in, yeah, that, like in that whole... It's like the ark story of the <laughs> New Testament. The well, animals. Well, it kind of is, yeah. That's true. That's true. So let's learn from our scripture. We'll do our best. We're going to attempt here. So um, the Gospel of Matthew's interpretation of the Old Testament prophecy is certainly exciting. She's going to bear a son. Mm-hmm. And we're going to name him Jesus. He's going to save people from the sins and going to name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Right. So God is with us. Where were you going with that? Um, It's a cool, uh, number one, it's just a really cool image. Absolutely. First of all. Um, and then the uh, Emmanuel, that's what that means. It means God with us, like yeah. God dwelling among us. And the picture is supposed to be that of the scene before Adam and Eve fell. The, or like, as it, it's in three, Adam heard the sound of the Lord mm. God walking in the garden. But God was there in mist, and it wasn't like a super spiritual, like, still small voice. I mean, it, it was, was as if like he were, God was there with yeah. them, you know. Wow. And so that's what we get, except we get it even more because this God has taken upon flesh and dwelt among us, as right. John says, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, um, I think what I was trying to get in this passage, too, is that not only is God in the flesh, but God is in, in the flesh with a purpose mm. to save us. And mm-hmm. we'll get into that, I think. But, um, yeah, because you go on and you say that there's a, a commentary from Daniel Harris, and he asked, do contemporary believers still need a Savior? What does a Savior save us from, and what does a Savior save us for? Right. These because, are tough questions. Man. I mean, as a Christian, as, as, a, as a Christian, it should be obvious. But when we're talking to non-Christians who may confront us with these questions, how do, you, how do we answer that? How do we... How do you explain that? There's still theologies in Christendom that also, what are you being saved from? Are you being saved from your your prejudice? Are you being saved from your, um, you know, bad habits? Mm. Are you, or are you being saved from being corrupt to being pure? Sure. There's a big difference there. And that's Absolutely. why I go into this self-help thing. A lot of people, Christians included, will believe, well, as long as I get this part of my life right, everything mm. will be good. Right. Or, but I also say there's a broader sense. Like, sometimes as Christians, we think of sin as something that's just one particular action. Sure. Or thought. Sure. And that's not it. It's our whole being that is separated from God. We are alienated from God. And so the only way that we get back is if the Holy Spirit transforms our hearts. Right. Yeah. It's not just because you stole that piece of bread one time or that cookie. Sure. Or even that you committed adultery or, you know, committed murder, whatever it is. That's not what you need saving from. It was wrong. You need saving because you're alienated from God. Yes. And there's no self-help book. There's no six, 12 steps. There's no nothing. There's nothing. That can change your heart from sinner to saint. Right? Only the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. sent by the resurrected Christ can do that. $15 billion. That's an amazing figure. On political campaigns since 2020. That's an amazing figure. And, and so some people have put their hopes in politics, and you sure. can tell. Like, Absolutely. Like, if you really think Don J. Trump or Joseph R. Biden or any political platform is going to, like, save save us, it's not it's not going to happen. No. Politics can maybe make a nation great, but can't do nothing with a soul. No. So, anyway, that's my point there, is that sometimes in our modern culture, we get pushed and we don't know what, what we even need saved from. Sure. Yeah, because we have these the, the world that tells us one thing, but Scripture tells us another. Yeah. You know. An experience should tell us that that you know, yeah. happens. So then those discussion questions there, are, are there for you to 
talk to your students about and and come up with some really good ways of uh, explaining this to people that maybe confront you during this time of year and you know why what what do i need a savior for why do i need a savior um that last you know. part of the question i just read it what what does a savior save us for yeah that's important and we talked about it last week yeah last week same close um that uh we're saved to do we're saved to be apostles yeah. apostles we're saved to be an ambassador we're saved yeah, we're to emissaries. spread this good news we're emissaries yeah. so we're not only just saved just for the sake of like now we can go you know hide in a rock and praise jesus all day right. but god then sends us on a mission we're saved sanctified to serve that's right three yeses i like it all that right. was good all right well let's apply the scripture we're gonna do our best so what ways can you employ during the season of Advent to enhance our faith and practice? I think one we've talked about already is just the rituals, the things that we normally do, the remembering of what Christ has done and sharing that message with others. That's yeah. that's one of them. What other ones do you think? Um, let's see. I don't know. I mean... Like we've said in the past couple, I mean, when you get to Christmas, you always do this kind of thing. But um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know how to add to or take away from. I've, I've written it down in here. If you want. <laughs> so you, you've talked several things in here. You know, how can we be more uplifting? How can we be yeah. more joyful? How can we share more of ourselves with our community around us. Yeah. Another great example, last week we talked a little bit about how do you pull away from the consumerism of, of this time yeah, of I year think that's and, and look at more service aspects. So what are some things that we can do? Can you serve in a soup kitchen? Can you help a, a needy family with Christmas presents? You know, most communities have some sort of angel tree or something of that nature where you can help some needy families supply their their kids some clothing and stuff that they yeah. need you know food that sort of thing i think like i guess the reason why i can't answer that really is because we really talked about it last yeah. week 30 minutes ago yeah so <laughs> uh it's hard to i mean but i do think the the especially if you're a young family carrying on the traditions of your family but then also incorporating tra new. historic traditions yeah. from the church into a new thing. Mm -hmm. Like Christians have been doing this for 2000 years. And so like, there's a lot of things we can borrow from. And, and if, if the rituals are still around, they're worth doing probably. Sure. sure. And, and so maybe, I mean like Advent calendars, mm -hmm. Advent wreaths. I mean, if you're going to do an Advent calendar, let's do something a little bit more than like the Advent wine calendar or like the <laughs> Harry Potter Advent calendar. <laughs> And I mean, yeah. like, you know, do like yeah. an actual advent calendar yeah. or an advent wreath. Another great readings. one is um, a Jesse tree. Yeah. You know, Jesse, if you if you don't know what a Jesse tree is, look that up. That's a really neat way to teach your children the story of Christ all the way through um, yeah. with using Christmas ornaments that they can hang on the tree. Yeah, that's a good one. I think yeah. um, if you're, I think, Jody Rush has um, a... Uh, uh, activity also that can be used during Advent for like it was a company that created a good Advent uh, series for during the time of COVID so it was okay. actually geared toward doing in the house with sure. your kids so that's something so yeah. if you want more information on that jrush at cumberland.org or also you can just email me or Becky so mm -hmm. Fleming at cumberland.org or rzarty however you yep, spell it rzarty z-a-h-r-t-e at cumberland.org yeah absolutely so there's a lot of ways that during this Advent season that we can incorporate yeah. just the joy and love of Christ into our everyday lives and, and share it with others. You close with this discussion question saying, share one, share with one another memories of spiritual growth during the Advent and Christmas seasons. Maybe it was a special worship service or a good time with family and friends. Why was it so meaningful? For me, one of the things that I think, unfortunately, a lot of our churches have gotten away from, and I wish they wouldn't, is I love Christmas Eve communion. Yep. I love that service. I love when they do it candlelight. Uh, there's just something so powerful and so meaningful about getting together with your brothers and sisters of Christ, sharing the communion table to celebrate the birth of the Savior. Yeah, um, that's, I mean, I owe my mother, if nothing else, got us to go to Easter Sunrise service 
every year, even when I wasn't a Christian. And then also, me and my dad just like to go to a Christmas Eve service um, because it's pretty. Um, and ultimately, that was how you know I found my way to salvation sure. during an Easter sunrise service. And so, just those rituals, like I'm, I'm not going to rehash it. Just yeah. the rituals are important. The rituals are important. Um, I'm just, I want to hit up uh, if you're applying this uh, lesson to the to the confession uh, 1.08. I'll just read the last part of it. God's will is made known supremely in the person of Jesus Christ, uh, who did God's will even to death. 1.16, God never leaves or forsakes his people. All who trust God find this truth confirmed in the awareness of his love, which includes judgment upon sin, leads to repentance and greater dependence upon God's grace. Goes on, but that's the one we're kind of focused on. And then 3.04, Jesus Christ, the eternal word made flesh, is always the essence of the one covenant of grace. Uh, and so, in, and then it goes on to talk about the old covenant, but ultimately Jesus uh -huh. Christ brings in the the, the, the revealed covenant. Right. We'll call it new is go. good, but um, definitely revealed. Revealed. So have a beautiful week this week, and would you like to? I will. Bless so I think so. Technically, this is December eighteenth, right? Yep. We're so, getting ready, friends. You've got a week. We're excited. Get your turkeys done. <laughs> get your ham done. Goose, Buy it all your whatever. stuff. Get, get your <laughs> presents done. Whatever you got to do. And then allow yourself time to just as if you've got mm. friends and family coming over. You're going you're gonna to make sure everything's yeah. ready for them so you can sit down and talk. Do the same thing for Jesus this week. Amen. So um, may the Lord bless you, keep you, make his face shine upon you, and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace and preach well and teach well. Amen. Amen. See you guys next week. Thank <laughs> you.